Hello, good evening, everyone. This is Attorney Angel. So as I mentioned in our last presentation, I will have a separate set of slides for, a lat for the Latin legal maxims. So let me start with a brief introduction regarding the legal, legal, Latin legal maxims or Latin maxims or legal maxims. Okay. So the use of Latin legal maxims has its origin from the Roman law. Roman law and Roman literature are well noted for their originality and style. And it is noteworthy to mention that our new civil code is also of Roman law origin. Although modern laws have taken over, Roman law still holds a valuable place to modern nations all over the world. And um, we still find Latin maxims to be useful up to this time, especially in the interpretation of statutes. And there are many cases in which judges and justices have used Latin legal maxims to emphasize the principles and doctrines enunciated in their decisions. And furthermore, admit it or not, the Latin maxims add to the elegance and style in the use of the language in these decisions to emphasize legal points. Okay, and if you're already lawyers, this will be useful to you and it will add an extra spice when you make your pleadings or when you cite legal maxims or Latin maxims in your pleadings in different documents or uh, position papers, legal opinion, etc. Okay. So let's start. We have lex prospicit, non respicit, which the English translation is the law looks forward, not backward. In connection with this, is lex de futuro, trudex de praterio, which translates to the law provides for the future, the judge for the past. This is connected with the prospectivity of our laws, particularly in Article 4 of the New Civil Code of the Philippines. It states that law shall have no retroactive effect unless the contrary is provided. In our jurisdiction, our statutes are to be construed as having prospective operation unless the purpose and intention of the legislature is to give them retrospective effect. But this must be expressly declared from the language of the law. And in case of doubt, the doubt must be resolved against retrospective effectivity. Okay. Um, but note that also uh, in the case of U.S. versus Diaz, Conde, a very old case, 1922, um, it stated that even when expressly so provided, a statute will not be given retroactive application if, number one, it will, there be, it, it will thereby become an ex post facto law, or number two, it would impair the obligation of contracts, or Number three, otherwise destroy or impair vested rights. The reason for this is the tendency of the retrospective application to be unjust and oppressive on account of the liability to unsettle vested rights of prior transactions. Okay. Moving on, we have absolute sententia expositore non indigent uh, sorry for the typo error that's non indigent not non indigent auto spell sorry which translates to 
when the language of the law is clear, no explanation of it is required. And another one, which is also connected to the first one, is optima statuti interpretatix est insum statutum. The English translation of which is the best interpreter of the statute is the statute itself. Okay. You can check out an old case, uh, People versus Mapa, a 1967 case, wherein the Supreme Court held that construction and interpretation come only after it has been demonstrated that application is impossible or inadequate with them. It is not within the power of a court to set aside the clear and explicit mandate of a statutory provision. Okay, next. We have uh, Rasho Legis Est Enima, or the reason of the law is its soul. Then, Rasho Legis Interpretation according to spirit and cesante rationae cesat ipsalex. Or when the reason of the law ceases, the law ceases also to exist. Okay. These are connected, okay? Uh, based on the principle that it is not the letter of the law that killeth, it is the spirit of the law that giveth life. Um, a staunch supporter of this is um, Justice Isagan Cruz, when he said that a too literal reading of the law is apt to constrict rather than fulfill its purpose and defeat the intention of its authors. That intention is usually found not in the letter that killeth, but in the spirit that giveth life, which is not really that evanescent or elusive. Judges must look beyond and not be bound by the language of the law seeking to discover by their own lights the reason and the rhyme for its enactment, that they may properly apply it according to its ends, they need and must use not only learning but also vision. But former Chief Justice Ramon Aquino, on the other hand, finds it risky to rely on the so-called spirit of the law and according to him, it is dangerous to rely on the so-called spirit of the law, which we cannot see nor handle, and about which we do not know very much. He said that it is safer to be guided by the ruling uh, that if the language of the law is clear and unequivocal, then read the law to mean exactly what it says. If not, look for the intention of the legislature. Okay. Next, we have expressio unius est exclusio alterius, which means express mention, express mention is implied exclusion. And this has been used in uh, numerous, this has been used in numerous cases, and it has not changed. This rule has not changed. Simply put, the enumeration of specified matters in a statute is construed as an exclusion of matters not enumerated unless a different intention appears. Next, generalia specialibus non derogant, which means that a general law does not nullify a specific or special law. You can also check out the case of Remo versus Secretary of Foreign Affairs, which is a 2010 decision regarding the renewal of the passport and reverting to maiden, reverting to the maiden name. In this case, it was held that it is a familiar rule of statutory construction that to the extent of any necessary repugnancy between a general and a special law or provision, the latter will control the former without regard to, to the respective dates of passage. Check that out. Okay. 
Of course, you all know this. Duralex said Lex. The law may be harsh, but it is the law. So when the law is clearly worded, there is no room for interpretation. Next. Cogitationis puenam nemo eberet, which translates to no man may be punished for his thought. Then, actus non facit reum nisi mensit rea, which translate to the act itself does not make a man guilty unless his intention were so. And actus me in vito factus non est meus actus, which translates to an act done by me against my will is not my act. Under Article 3 of the Revised Penal Code, the first element of a felony must be that of um, a volunteer. Uh, um, again, the, under the Revised Penal Code, under Article 3, first element of a felony must be that the act or omission is voluntary. So if the alleged criminal act is committed by an insane person, he is not criminally liable, but he may be civilly liable. Okay? Re or refer also to Article 12 of the Revised Penal Code. Okay. Another... Um, Latin legal maxim, which is very familiar to you, ignorantia legis deminem excusat. Ignorance of the law excuses no one, which is based on Article 3 of the New Civil Code, stating that ignorance of the law excuses no one from compliance therewith. And ignorantia facto excusat which means that ignorance or mistake in point of fact is an excuse. Next. Ubelex non distinguit, nec nos distinguere debemos. Which translates to, where the law does not distinguish, we should not distinguish. A very good application of this is Article 3, Section 1 of the Constitution, which states that no person shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor shall any person be denied the equal protection of the laws. Such that the constitutional guarantee of due process is granted to every Filipino, regardless of... Um, regardless of status, regardless of the province where you came from, regardless of whether you are rich or poor, educated or non-educated, regardless of political beliefs and religious beliefs. Next. Men's legislatores. Men's legislators refer to the principle with respect to the courts that the court should give the statute a reasonable or liberal instruction which will best affect its purpose rather than one which will defeat it. Okay. You may check out the case of Prasnik versus Republic. in connection with this Latin maxim. Okay, next we have, uh, sorry for the typo error again. This is redendo singula singulis, not redenen, okay? So that's redendo singula singulis, which means that each word or phrase must be referred to their proper connection in order to give it proper force and effect, rendering none of them useless or superfluous. So it literally means referring each to each. A good example of this is the wordings used in Article 31 of the Family Code, 
Act A, which states that a marriage in Articulo Mortis between passengers or crew members may also be solemnized by a ship captain or by an airplane pilot, not only while the ship is at sea or the plane is in flight, but also during stopovers at ports of calls. So the phrase may also be solemnized by the ship captain refers to the phrase while the ship is at sea. And the phrase or the plane is in flight refers to the air, airplane pilot. May also be solemnized by the airplane pilot while the plane is in flight. And the phrase, but also during stopovers, ports of call, refers to the ship captain and airplane pilot. Next, we have casus omissus pro omiso habendus est, which means that a case omitted is to be held as intentionally omitted, or an object or a thing or person omitted from enumeration in the statute must be held to have been intentionally omitted. In connection with this, you can check out uh, other provisions of the new civil code as well. Okay. Moving on, we have nositur associis, which means that um, where a particular word or phrase in a statute is ambiguous in itself or is equally susceptible of various meanings, its true meaning may be made clear and specific by considering the company in which it is found or with which it is associated. You can look into Article 420 of the Civil Code as an example. And next, we have edus dem generis, which means that when general words follow the designation of particular things, or classes of persons or subjects, the general words will usually be construed to include only those persons or things of the same class or general nature as those specifically enumerated. Sample of this is section 185 of the local government code. We have more Latin legal maxims in our list. Okay, so we have Ambiguitas verborum patens nulle verificatione excluditur. Which means that a patent ambiguity cannot be cleared by extrinsic evidence. So, to recall, we have defined ambiguity as doubtfulness, doubleness of meaning, indistinctness, or uncertainty of meaning of the expression used in a written instrument. So, a statute is ambiguous where some words used therein may refer to several objects, and the manner of their use does not disclose the particular object to which the words refer. Okay, we have next, contempt. Porain, can, contemporanea esposicio est fortissima in lege, or contemporary construction is strongest in law, which means that in construing a statute, courts will take into consideration all the facts and circumstances existing at the time of and leading to the enactment of the statute, such as the history of the times, contemporary customs, statute of the existing law, the evils to be remedied, and the remedy provided. Next. Falsa demonstratio non nocet cum de corpore constat. Our false description does not make an instrument inoperative which is otherwise clear. A misdescription or misnomer in a statute will not render a statute void or render it inoperative, provided the means of identifying the person or thing intended, apart from the erroneous description, are clear and certain. So the courts 
consider the entire statute and reject the misdescription or substitute it with the proper words in order to give effect to the legislative intent. Okay. Next, we have generalia verba sunt generaliter intelligenda, or meaning what is generally spoken shall be generally understood. And interpretare et, interpretare et concordare legis, legibus est optima interpretandi. Sorry for the typo again. So let me repeat. Interpretare et concordare legis legibus est optimus interpretandi. This is regarding the harmonization of laws with other laws. You can check out the case of Araneta versus Concepcion. Okay. In this case, it was uh, held by the Supreme Court that all the provisions of the law, even if apparently contradictory, should be allowed to stand and give an effect by reconciling them if necessary. Next. We have index animi sermo est, or speech is the index of intention. You may refer to Article 1370 of the New Civil Code, which states that if the terms of a contract are clear and leave no doubt upon the intention of the contracting parties, the literal meaning of its stipulation shall control. If the words appear to be contrary to the evident intention of the parties, the latter shall prevail over the former. Okay, so it is more applicable in terms of the intention in contracts. Verba intentioni non e contra debent in servire. Or words ought to be more subservient to the intent than the intent to the words. Animus hominis est anima scripti. Intention is the soul of an instrument. And litera necat spiritus vivicat. Or an instrument must be interpreted according to the intention of the parties thereto. Okay, you can also refer to Section 12, Rule 130 of the Rules of Court, which provides that in the construction of an instrument, the intention of the parties is to be pursued. And when a general and a particular provision are inconsistent, the latter is paramount to the former. So a particular intent will control a general one that is inconsistent with it. Okay. So that's it for our Latin legal maxims. So I hope uh, it will be useful to you. And uh, I hope uh, if you have time, can memorize these Latin legal maxims. Uh, maybe I'll include it in the midterms or the finals. Okay, so thank you very much for your time. Thank you for listening. I hope you learned something. Thank you and God bless. Don't forget to be grateful. Glorify God with a grateful heart. Thank you.